Tim Joyce, we're back to the screens. Kind of like live from Vegas. Live from Vegas. <laughs> That's right. You're at uh, Wonderful Health uh, yeah. that Mar Marina and I, um, to be honest, don't have that much FOMO. I mean, obviously, missing everybody in 3D, right. and you know, it's right. a good place to see everybody. Um, but after Frontiers, we saw you know smaller subset, but that was great. Yeah. Um, and and our you know crazy ass episode live that 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 panned out <laughs> right. pretty right. decent. <laughs> I know I haven't back heard back that. from David uh, David Klein, so hopefully I saw him. He had, uh, he had a huge booth. He had a huge booth here. I uh, saw yeah. him from the distance, but I haven't said hi to him yet. There was so many people I just saw literally on Wednesday or something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> a little bit like too much, you know. <laughs> which which is amazing to me that you know people are like from Berlin to Vegas, right? Um, right. So right. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a circuit. Anyway. There's a circuit. <laughs> But you're looking sharp and fresh, so uh, I know it's still morning-ish uh, morning time frame. But let's uh, let's let in um, Ross, right? So Ross is the founder of Limbic. Um, I think this will be a first for you and I, Jim, as we let Ross in. Hang tight. You're in. You're on camera. <laughs> you're with us. I'm just setting the scene. <laughs> and I first heard about Ross from our mutual friend at Cliphouse. And I mm. think this will be the first for us because we usually, Ross, just for you to know, we usually kind of invite people that we, one of us at least knows, in, and most of the time, both of us know. So you're the first person that is a no-no for <laughs> either one of us. So welcome to the shot. Um, Thank you. Of digital health therapy. That's uh, and we're we're here for some therapy with Dr. Ross Harper. So excellent. For... Yeah, so uh, I'm not not that kind of doctor. I should say up front. Uh, I'm, hey, a, I'm a fake enough. doctor. I'm, I'm a PhD, not an MD. Well, that's amazing. I mean, that's totally the type of doctor we were thinking of. We want more PhDs involved in this, you know, unless <laughs> so you're a total doctor but, in our minds anyway, but as you're comfortable with. <laughs> but uh, but I but I like your CYA right up front. And you know, for the millions of listeners and viewers, uh, Ross, if you can just take us through journey of Ross, you know, you can start from, as I like to say, from birth, you know. Personal, professional, and, you know, Jim and I will, as usual, interrupt. Sounds good. I like being interrupted. And thanks for uh, breaking wow. with the paradigm and, and wow. agreeing to meet with someone who you've never met previously. I hope I hope this is the first of many and not, not first and last. Um, I don't know if you can hear my dog barking in the background. So the first experience no. that I, I'm happy no. to share with you is that I have a, a four-year-old Staffordshire Terrier who is my life. And, right. Well, uh, you're welcome to join if you I want. I was going to gonna say, yeah, we, we, you know, I got, I got mine somewhere in the kitchen, probably right. trying to find right. food. The bar, just for uh, the for the record, Ross, the bar in production here is is very minimal. <laughs> so if he we, comes in, he comes in. <laughs> awesome. Um. Well, yeah. I'm happy to tell you. Um. Whatever you're interested in. Um. Born in London. Uh, okay. I don't know if you can tell from my accent. So, born and raised in Southeast London. Went to school in a place called. Uh, Lewisham, if you're familiar with it. Oh, hey, my dog's decided to enter. That's not awesome. <laughs> Welcome. <guys> behind me. <laughs> he just barged his way in. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's uh, it was a great place to grow up, made some dear friends. Um, went to do my undergraduate degree at Cambridge University. Um, they have an interesting um uh, way of teaching science there where they basically lump everything into one area they call it natural sciences okay now if you want to do physics you're doing natural sciences if you want to do mathematics natural sciences biology chemistry natural sciences Interesting. this is really good because i would have made the wrong decision as a 17 year old applying for a degree mm, if right. i hadn't just had to apply for everything because the benefit right. was we got to pick and choose while we were there it was a little bit like the american system where you you end up majoring in something but you've got a bunch of different minors so right. i ended up getting a chance to do um what i thought i wanted to do which is sort of cellular biology okay. but i also threw in organic chemistry math and uh, history and philosophy and i ended up finding hmm. neuroscience Wow. And I'd never have known that's what I wanted to do, but I found it 
um, while I was doing my undergraduate degree at Cambridge. And how would it? And uh, how does a seventeen-year-old know what the hell they want to do? Right. Anyway, right. Well, it's such a tough situation, <laughs> Jim. Put, I still uh, don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> right. Right. Honestly, right. I mean, I keep saying that all over again, but yeah. It's so tough, isn't it? We expect people to make this really important decision and in many ways specialise when all they've experienced is school and a school curriculum. There's right. so much out there. I, I never did re really did neuroscience when I was at school. Right. Um, so, yeah, I had to find it, and I did. And I'm so glad I did because it's my, you know, uh, it's a passion. I know that word is thrown around a lot, but I just, I love it. Um, and, uh, yeah, graduated was like, hell yeah, I want to spend the rest of my life understanding the brain, trying to unlock its secrets. This, this gray squidgy organ, um, is something that I could, I could really spend decades, um, devoted to, but my, in my humble opinion at the time as a 21 year old, I thought, yeah, but, um, the future of this field will probably be in mathematical approaches. Okay. Rather than mm -hmm. um, scalpel, white coat, slicing right. into the brain. Um, obviously, it's a bit of both. But uh, uh, I was becoming more and more interested in math and how we can use that to simulate compute. And uh, and so I did my master's degree in mathematical modeling at University College London, which is where I stayed to do my PhD at the intersection of AI and neuroscience. So I got to marry the discipline together and. Many people don't realize that neuroscience and artificial intelligence are, you know, almost two sides of the same coin. Right. So much of what we know about artificial intelligence or, or, mm -hmm. or what is described as machine learning comes from what we understand about the brain. Um, right. Because the, the brain and the, particularly the human brain is a biological exemplar of intelligence. So if we're going to try and simulate that in silico, in computers, then it makes sense to first understand, well, how does the brain compute? And, you know, you right. look at deep neural network, one of the most popular machine learning models. And, and, you know, it's called a neural network because it's in many ways inspired by the interconnectivity of neurons. And then we struggled with neural network or traditional neural network. They, they weren't quite working with image processing. So what do we do? We go back to the brain. We look at how the visual cortex does things. We identify these convolutional architectures and all of a sudden convolutional neural networks and things start working again. So there's this lovely interplay between neuroscience and AI. And, and what, like, Can, did your did your family, did you have, like, I mean, like for a 17 year old to land on nerves, you're obviously quite academically strong for the pedigree of university, <laughs> universities you've gone to, but like, how did you land on that? I mean, were you, were you, were you also- Inspiration? Part, yeah. <laughs> inspiration uh, i don't know i just well i found it while i was uh, doing my undergrad the 17 year old ross had no idea 17 okay. year old ross thought he was going to do some biological subject that was just okay. way off okay. when i got to university i got to try lots of different things and i found it but i mean if, if i'm honest with you i knew i wanted to do science okay that was a big part of my identity yeah. as a 17 year old okay um and i think uh well i know that came from my dad hmm you know, he was, uh, he'd done a PhD in microbiology and okay. he'd worked in labs for a bit, but then he moved into um, the civil service. So he was a uh, chief scientist of the Department of Health. Uh -huh. And one thing that I vividly remember is when I was really young, he bought me a chemistry set and then we would mm -hmm. do that together. And then it, right. it like, I, I must have been a weird kid because then I was like, more, please. I want to do more of these things. Probably yeah. because I was just enjoying spending time with my dad, right? Like solving puzzles. Right. But um, he, another time he came back from the butchers with a cow's heart and we just cut it up together on the on the <laughs> kitchen table. And I was really young, but a, we were a, like- A fun weekend to thing to do. Diagram. Honestly, yeah, like, amazing. yeah. We, <laughs> I mean, I remember it now, right? I re I remember these moments, uh, and we were like, "This is the atria, or the, this is an atrium, and these are the ventricles, and this is how it works." And you're sort of like thinking about yourself in that way. You're just like, "There's a pump, right. and having blood around my body." <laughs> yeah, and how does like as a as a PhD in neuroscience, how how do you how does that memory so vivid? I've always wondered about like how is that memory so vivid that you can remember sitting there and yet like I, I'm in health right now. Jim, he's still younger than, than us. So right, just, just FYI. I, so 
I'm trying to remember like basic things, right? <laughs> yeah, I oh no, I don't know. Firstly, you know, I, I'm I'm an old soul, you know, so <laughs> I I feel old. Um, but yeah, I I I guess memory itself is anybody who tells you it's completely understood is is lying to you. It's probably true of a lot in neuroscience. <laughs> to be honest with you, we've only okay. scratched the surface. We we we. I like to think of the field as you in a dark room with a torch and you've illuminated certain things, but you don't yet have that unifying context that you get when you switch the light on. Okay. Um, and, uh, but in terms of memory, it's well known that early memories uh, are incredibly strong typically. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, uh, you know, unfortunate cases where people um, suffer from uh, neurodegenerative uh, mm -hmm. illness and they begin to lose their memories, they actually almost lose them often anyway. The memories that persist are the early ones. Um, right. So they lose them in reverse order. Short term memory goes and then you sort of like work your way back and people are then remembering things from their childhood in their later years. So those early memories are incredibly strong, I guess, because they're in, they're formative. Right. Um, right. And like a building yeah, block. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, exactly. But we don't claim to be an expert in, in memory <laughs> consolidation. No, no, cool, cool, cool. But b before we go into kind of more of the, I mean, you've been taking us on the, on, on the personal track, right? Mm. And, you know, we'd love to learn. Mm. But before we go there, I want to interject on kind of brain. Um, for our listeners, you know, like how much do we know about the brain, right? And what are the, and not, you know, we obviously don't need a whole class on it, but just at a kind of high level. What do we know about the brain and what do we don't know? <clears throat> like what's... What's a complete mystery? Oh, if gosh. Yeah, put me on the spot. Um, uh, shoot from the hip, bearing in mind, I've not been in academia yeah. for some time. So okay, yeah, yeah. may have moved on without me and, and all my previous colleagues are screaming. Well, you also right zoomed now. into mental health, which is still, yeah. you know, quite a lot yeah. unknown, right? But yeah, so all I good. I think that um, we, we understand a lot around the base processing, the sort of atomic unit of compute. We understand pretty well. We understand um, uh, a lot around learning and synaptic plasticity. It's not just the network. It's in the strengths of the connections between the neurons. I think a lot, like one of the the next frontiers is cognition. So, mm. you know, you've got this sort of ball of electrical activity, which is sending information in ways that we, we in various areas, particularly, we really understand quite well. We've mapped it out very well. But the jump from that to consciousness and sort of mm -hmm. the cognitive theories, those are, are still shrouded in a lot of mystery and ambiguity. And we neuroscience is so exciting because you can get at that with um, different psychological tests and uh, observing um, behaviors and psychometric testing. But there's a difference between understanding how the neurons are firing and the information that is moving, but then actually managing to map that to higher level consciousness. I think this is still, you know, you, you, you um, tread into philosophy quite quickly, mm -hmm. actually. Right. Um, and yeah, you end up having these late nights where you just kind of go down a rabbit hole and you start questioning everything you know <laughs> about the universe. So, so Ross, you'd be happy to know, as you were talking, I actually asked Chad GPT and what remains mysterious. <laughs> One is consciousness. So you you uh, you win. Two is memory oh, storage and retrieval, which you mentioned earlier. You know, I kind of talked about a little bit of the mental disorder, yeah. which I know we're going to focus yeah. more. Four is dark matter of the brain. Um, and then five individual variability. Look at this. So that's at least the, the most to chat GPT. So this, this is the most research he's ever done. You, you, <laughs> Me, yes, that's correct. amazing. That's amazing. I'm glad I didn't get completely outed by chat GPT soon. Just claim, <laughs> claim <Good> conscious, <laughs> conscious hallucination. <laughs> So cool, you cool, got cool. your, you know, let's, let's pick up where we left yeah. off and then get into the more professional non-research, mm. non-academia. Mm. So continue with your amazing story. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, um, uh, Eugene, I'm, I was getting to the end there. Uh, so I finished up my PhD. I'd, you know, by most accounts, it, it had been a, a good one. I published um, papers which made the defense slightly easier. So if, if you're familiar, 
you have to defend your thesis at the end mm-hmm. of a PhD and and um you know some academics from other universities come in as sort of judges essentially and they yep. tear you apart a little bit and they try and tell you that it it's not good enough and you need to make changes here and there and they'll only sign off on it as being of a certain standard when xyz have been completed it helps if during your phd you publish peer review papers through the typical publishing route you know you submit to a journal um and reviewers find that work to be appropriate the journal accepts it and then they publish it because that is the academic process and it becomes hard to say that the peer review process has failed right from your phd judges so you just end up sort of making the chapters of your thesis the published papers and it, and it and it um so I, I wasn't as stressed coming to the end of my phd as um right. i might otherwise have been and it had gone really well but i'd become maybe slightly disillusioned with academia still believe in it wholeheartedly and uh you know i found my community during my phd but i was very motivated by real world impact which i wasn't quite getting from publishing papers and having them be cited but then like maybe the world isn't changing as a direct result of that or not quickly right. enough um so I, I decided i wanted to um uh go and build my own thing uh, and i i knew what i wanted to do now i wanted to use my um what I felt was an unfair advantage at the intersection of AI and the brain to try and um, make things better for the field of mental health care. Because if I could do that, I thought one, there was a, you know, there was a huge economic opportunity because it, it's a business. I mean, we were structuring the enterprise as a business. Um, but two, and this was the real motivator, I could directly be responsible for large scale positive impact in the world if successful and i like that mission uh, i like being motivated by sort of a uh, something like that so started a company straight out of phd wow amazing wow. how long ago and was so, that, that was yeah slim. same Sorry. question okay yeah uh, it was six years ago i think maybe seven um but i should disclaimer the company in its current incarnation has been going for four years because we okay. did a hard pivot and okay. i can tell you why because I I really wanted to use AI to improve mental health care, but I didn't know how. And I didn't, um, I was a researcher. And I did what I think is one of the key mistakes. I made the key mistake that people who are technical often do when they move into startup. They structure their business more like a research project than like a business. Okay, Mm -hmm. And so I basically was incredibly forward thinking. I was like, what is really out there as a technical challenge? What is the most out there thing that I think I could achieve that no one else can do, which is kind of how scientists think. And um, I settled on, uh, this was sort of like 2018. I settled on, um, and I had a co you know, um, could we take the physiological data that was coming from wearable devices because you know mm-hmm. wearable devices in 2018 were a hotter topic than maybe they are now apple sure. and apple watch was coming out and you know everyone was excited so i thought hey this is really interesting there's a new way to collect heartbeat data at scale that's never been possible before how exciting right. and then i thought could we use this new signal that has never before been available at this scale and interpret from the heartbeat signal what's happening in the brain could okay. we back infer changes in mental state from the signature left in the heartbeat um and that would take some complex time series analysis you know some, some machine learning applied to, yep. to the heartbeat time series um and the short answer is yes you can we published uh, you know limbic in this early uh, form published papers on this but we weren't we were it was just a research project it was can we do it yes we can but what's the business you know what's the economic model where is the value creation and very quickly we realized that um you know we we were doing quite well we got pilots with some of the big wearable companies um but we kind of asked ourselves i remember there was this sobering moment in uh maybe early 2020 when i thought hang on a second if we knock it out of the park 
can close all the big wearable companies. How big is this market? How big right, is right. this business? You know, how will this attract venture, venture right. capital? Um, and will this really be the direct route to changing the face of mental health care? I'm not. I'm not so sure. It just feels like a small piece of right. a of a largely consumer facing it, product. It's a it's a feature, not not a mm -hmm. business, right? Totally, totally. So that was that was my sort of mistake. That was me cutting my teeth in in startup. Sure. Um, and you know the message there is we achieved the technical um, ambition. Challenge, yeah. We, yeah. We, that that paper that we published under Limbic, where we were looking at changes in mental state from heartbeat time series, that's one of my most cited papers as an academic. Right. But um, there was it, it didn't it didn't get us to changing the world. It didn't create a, um, you know the flywheel. So then we asked ourselves around 2020, hey look. Surely the way we actually improve mental health care is by being a standalone player within it. And what would a fully limbic packaged product look like for the mental health care industry? And that's where we went back to the drawing board and we eventually axed the wearable device. And we said, we think we can do a lot in terms of clinical modeling of mental, mental health mm -hmm. through the data we can collect from a smartphone. So mm -hmm. let's just depend on that. Way better penetration, way more utilization. Um, you know, your unit costs as a product are much lower because you don't require anybody to procure the wearable on top. And right. let's see if we can go to the care providers. You know, we started in the NHS, and I'll talk more about why I love the NHS. But um, we went to the NHS, we started asking the question, what's your biggest problem? Right. Where are your biggest challenges? You know, what keeps you up at night? And then they'll tell you and you'll hear the same thing over and over again. And suddenly you start to think, well, hang on, I can now come up with solutions to these problems. That's the beginning of a business. Um, you know, so we had the AI chop from 2018, but 2020 was when we started to think around what's the product? What's the value mm -hmm. proposition? What's the business model? And then it really took off. Um, we launched in 2020 um so we we moved quite quick to a to a minimum viable product and right. uh now that product that launched in 2020 is in 40 percent of nhs talking therapy services around the country it's when i just talked to um i went up to your booth at health i'm in health and i went up to your booth and uh and nice. your new head of marketing or your u.s marketing person um was running the booth and she said 40 percent. so i was blown away by that so what is the what, what is, is the, the product product, the product? <clears throat> yeah, the product is an AI assistant for clinicians and patients throughout the care journey. So it's a healthcare yeah. product, not a wellness solution. There were plenty of direct-to-consumer wellness solutions in the App Store. We didn't want to be another one of them. We wanted to solve a problem for healthcare provision. So at the very front door, Limbic embeds at intake, and it performs, uh, it collects basic information, it performs triage, and it, and it um does as much as possible to do the heavy lift on a clinical mental health assessment. Okay. That then outputs directly into the electronic health record where it's okay. picked up by a um, clinician within the services to whom we, we uh, sell to. And that clinician now can run an incredibly high quality, very high efficient, highly efficient um, clinical mental health assessment. What okay. may have taken 60 to 90 minutes can go way down and at the same time, patient outcomes get better. So you're minimizing uh, uh, clinician time, which is the valuable resource in this industry, and you're maximizing clinical outcomes, which is the key to social impact. And then that system, but just so you know, like that's the front door tool, that system then hands off to a generative AI care companion that works with the patient while they're on the waiting list and in between treatment sessions all the while providing clinical intelligence back to the clinician. So that in that way, we, we seek to serve both sides of the equation, the patient as well as the clinician. And in doing so, try to um, maximize both the economics of care delivery for our clients. There needs to be a business case. Yeah. You know, they need to keep the lights on. But at the same time, we consider our job done if we see patient outcomes going up and to the right. There's so many solutions are, you know, one will be back office, administrative automation and looking to drive a value prop there. 
Others are just digital therapeutics that only face the patient. We seek to span the continuum to create service efficiencies, but also patient outcomes. And, and that's where uh, I think we found our niche. So maybe just walk, uh, you know, the triage process, like, and again, maybe I'm going to oversimplify it, but, you know, I get to my NHS website, you know, in, in a particular, and I want to be triaged, right? I'm asking some questions. Uh, ultimately, is this AI asking me a derivative of some sort of a PHQ-8 or 9, or, you know, some level of that kind of assessment up front? And so when a physician or mental health professional gets it, there's already a score from, you know, you, you might be at 12, right? On a PHQ-8 yeah. or whatever. Just walk, yeah. walk us through a little bit. And what happens after I see my therapist, right? Yeah, is, yeah, is yeah, it yeah, app, yeah. Is it an app? And does it have a name? Like that, is it a, like Johnny Limbic or something? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will answer all questions and I'll try to do them sequentially. So the first thing is, is it like the PHQ-9 or the PHQ-8? No. Okay. So... To say that would be like saying what a uh, what the clinician does at clinical assessment is administer a routine outcome measure like the PHQ-9. But they do so much more. They take the history, they manage expectations of care. They also in- integrate through targeted questioning, which may include routine outcome measures, but also, um, you know, sort of naturalistic conversation. They seek to formulate a hypothesis around the primary presenting problem and any secondary factors or risk factors. Limbic does the exact same thing. So it's far more comprehensive. It may administer a routine outcome measure, but we're using probabilistic machine learning models in the background to guide adaptive naturalistic questioning and conduct as close as possible to something reminiscent of a psyche eval or a biopsychosocial assessment. Um, and then the output of that looks like that that has been completed by another member of the care team. And then we identify the areas where we need them to sort of like uh, uh, yeah. a real clinician to sort of like hone in on. And in this way, what we're really seeking to do is amplify the clinicians, right? Because they are the limited resource. They are the reason that, you know, downstream of supply and demand is that many people don't have access to care or the economics of care delivery are are hard to, to get to work, right? So mm-hmm. what we're trying to do is use safe clinical AI that is backed by a number of peer review studies, and we can talk more about that, and has also in the UK been regulated as a medical device. Okay. We're trying to use that to graduate our limited pool of expert clinicians into the role of clinical supervisors and experts coming in only to do the things that expert human clinicians should be doing. That makes sense. So that's the front door tool, and that's how it's different from a, a routine outcome measure. Does that answer your question, Eugene? It t- totally does. And, you know, it's it's interesting to me, and I think this is where I caught and I reached out to Ed because, you know, to get connected. Mm. I'm going to put you in the spot, and I know you're working with therapists. You know, there's all these promises of AI replacing, you know, therapists, replacing coaches, replacing doctors. Mm. You know, I'll be frank with you, and I'm not afraid to call out. I know, like company like Wobot has had multitude of studies done. Again, I'm I'm not diving into those studies. I've tried it so many times, just by the fact that I know it's a chatbot. So I'll I'll leave it at that. I think you know where I'm going with the question. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I'll t- I'll talk in broad terms rather than target any one. Um, yeah. organization I think that the simplistic notion that AI will replace the therapist is a bit naive definitely quite arrogant and isn't really helpful anyway um, I think the more nuanced and I find interesting um, question is what does a blended AI care delivery model look like Mm -hmm. Um, that's non-trivial to figure that out. You know, the text one part, the care delivery wraparound is the other part. Um, How does the expertise of a human clinician, and as you said, um, Eugene, potentially the the just raw humanity that could never be um, simulated regardless of performance of an AI, how does that find its way to the core 
of an AI powered care paradigm in the future with where AI is used to scale the clinician to serve everybody who needs support rather than right now the, the just um, the catastrophic work mm -hmm. supply issues that we're experiencing. And mm -hmm. I think that's the interesting question. I think also users of the D2C wellness apps or other chatbots may have experienced the limitations of what is talked about, like rules-based AI or scripted, you know, natural language yeah. processing in its traditional form. We are entering a new era where language modeling has really jumped up a level yeah. to the extent that it isn't like talking to a brick wall. You don't detect the same patterns coming up time and time again because it's the same script coming back at you. And right. now this feels um, actually like a productive conversation. The challenge is how do we use the latest language models, these large language models, how do we use them in a way that is clinically safe, protocol adherent, and compliant to the laws of you know the regulated healthcare and, industry. And I think very, in my opinion, it should be very transparent to that patient or individual user what's generated by AI versus Absolutely. by a real human. I, you know, Absolutely. my wife and I, we run a health coaching company and we're actually very much adamant on augmenting coaches. And if there is mm -hmm. anything that's automated, our end users need to know that it's automated and it's not coming from the coach, right? So I 100%. think we're we're just very, very, very particular on that. 100%. That, that's the ethics of it, right? Anyone who's trying to shy away from that fact is shying away from the challenge of solving the AI care model. Right. You know, they're just trying to sweep it under the rug. Case in point, the Limbic, by the way, Eugene, to, um, to uh, give you some uh, reassurance, Limbic introduces itself as an AI. There are also, yeah. you know, opt-in clauses. As a medical device, we, yeah. had, we yeah. got audited. We had to be found to, to meet the highest standards in terms of um, care uh, governance and, um, and uh, um, information governance and like clinical rigor there. But yep. um, what, really interesting finding that you might uh, be keen to hear about. Even though the patient knows it's an AI, now that you've shone a light on that, this can be a feature rather than a bug. Yep. And what we found, we published a Nature Medicine paper earlier this year, largest study of its kind. It was multi-site, had about 130,000 unique patients in the sample size, which if you followed the literature, you will know that dwarf is that's that's anything yeah. else, unprecedentedly large. And what we found um, really like fired up our team. Firstly, the uh, front door clinical assessment support AI was associated with a statistically significant increase in the number of patients self-referring into care. Interesting. So mm -hmm. empathetic, warm front door that helped them identify there was a need that could and that they could benefit from treatment options, that manifested as a statistically significant increase in referrals across the country. 15% increase. Here's what really became interesting. And this is in that Nature Medicine paper. We found that the increase was proportionally greater for minority communities and, and underserved yeah. demographics. So there was a 39% increase uh, from Asian demographics, if I believe, 40% increase in Black demographics, and um, a whopping 179% in non-binary. And that's not an exhaustive list. Wow. There, there were more. Sure. Yeah. All statistically significant. We, we had to try and find a way to answer this question. What's going on here? Why are we seeing this? And when we ran thematic analysis on the patient feedback, because we're constantly collecting feedback from people with lived experience, we collected the feedback and the key themes that were drawn out from those, um, you know, uh, 100 or something thousand um, uh, transcripts were, it's an AI. That, they knew that. So it's not judging me. Right. Fascinating, That's what I was fascinating finding. And, the, and the other one for, the, um, uh, for many of the minority communities was, it doesn't have a race or a gender. It's not clashing with mine. Interesting. So if you lean in to AI, you do it safely, you show the evidence base, 
you do what you need to do in order to be compliant, then you can actually benefit from things that a human can't do. And now you get into this really interesting sort of like um, uh, marriage between expert human capabilities and things that only an AI can do, and then you can scale mental health. Care. But it, you know, it is, it's so funny. My son was, um, my 17 year old son, who's actually applying for university in, in the UK. And he was asking me, you know, he's, so, you know, socially learning how to interact with people. And he was just said to me, he says, you know, when I interact with adults, you know, some of them I'm very comfortable with and I can talk and I express myself and other ones I struggle with. And I said, well, what do you think the difference is? He's like, I feel like, the ones I like don't judge me. You know, yeah. it's a very human experience <clears throat> that when you meet someone, like if you meet Eugene at a conference, Eugene, we say is the most loved man in digital health, right? You meet I'm, Eugene. I'm at blushing. A, I'm <laughs> blushing. You meet him at a conference, but you walk in, it's like positive, um, mm. helpful, uh, and not judging. And mm. not judging, right? And and you don't and there's not a secret judgment underneath it. And you can't tell what race or gender he is, you know. I'm joking. Yeah. I mean, you know, some days I look very different than other days, especially when I shave my head. Um, so fa fascinating, a human, but human experience. But it, it is a human experience, but it's actually something interesting you said, right? Um, this empathetic front door. And that's actually, you know, I'm going to drill down a little bit on that because, you know, today, um, you know, is there emotion in AI? Is there empathy in AI? You know, because we don't know much about the consciousness of the brain and what will click on, you know, empathy and emotion, is this something that you can see even in the next five years really starting to hit the mark? Or actually the lack of the fact of judgment zone, you could argue that's somewhat empathy and some emotion, is what's actually winning over people engaging. So I guess... The short version of my question is empathy and emotion, and I know those are two different things. Um, is that something that's coming in AI or it's already here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so hard. It becomes, it, it's hard for it not to devolve into a semantic discussion, I guess, right? Because right. Um, the system can simulate emotion in the sense that it yeah. can give the other user in an interaction the feeling and, and signaling of emotion right. and empathy. Um, and maybe that's enough if right. what we're really trying to yeah. do is make people feel at ease so that they can start start the care journey. Um, you know, maybe that's enough. Whether or not the system itself feels emotion, um, yeah. firstly, no. Like, yeah. I'm just a spoiler alert, no. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> but could it ever... Well, now we get back into that sort of like, we don't Philosophy. quite understand yeah. consciousness or the conscious right. experience. Yeah, yeah. And then it gets very philosophical. And, and I think really, actually, um, humanity is going through this exciting paradigm shift. We're all incredibly lucky that we're living through this moment where we could steer things to a really, really better world. I, I sincerely believe that. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I, if I didn't believe that. But we will have to ask ourselves really challenging questions around what does it actually even mean to be human? What do we mean when we talk about intelligence and emotion and consciousness? Right. Because we haven't really had to ask ourselves that because we've been the only thing that is at all relevant in that conversation. But right. now, you know, we're, we're really having to dive into those details as we create something that is sufficiently complex and performant that, um, yeah, that uh, I, I think... The future of almost all industries will be what does the marriage between human expertise and AI capability yeah. look like? And yeah. we must all take up the mantle, figure out the model. And um, and then I do think that people will be better off as a result of it. Jim, cancel all your meetings in Vegas. We're going to carry the show on for another two hours and get philosophical. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> So what's what's how next was, for how you was guys? health by yeah. the way how was health was it good uh, yeah it's it's epic um epic you know the I know you guys are up for an award right you are up for or you're part of a pavilion or in your launching yeah I think or you've launched I think we're a finalist for best AI healthcare win I think that's what 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 we're there for I unfortunately couldn't go which I, was, I had huge FOMO 
It looked incredible. <laughs> um, I, it is. I wasn't incredible. able to attend. I, I yeah. tried not to look at pictures. And yeah, therefore, no. I keep saying I don't have FOMO because I haven't looked at pictures. Listen, I mean, it's 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 so like I've done three, you know, I've done three of this health. I mean, it, like um, you know, the fellow that's at this, you know, health conference is up. It's a phenomenon, right? Like we were just in health in yeah. Europe not too long ago. So the 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 coalescence, like yet last night I listened to Lenny Kravitz talk about you know working with dentists that were giving core you know care wow. care to you know underprivileged people, wow. but you know like it was just so so cool the technology you know um, and then this whole transformation of what's AI and what's not AI and uh, mm. so it's just mind blowing it's a little overwhelming I think I'm kind of mm. I was. I was looking forward to coming to my hotel room and just having a conversation. <laughs> with, with, with that. Well, I, I, I joke, I joke around that if, if people don't have ADHD, they will come back with it, even though I know you can't get it that way. But, but, but. like, you know, when you're well, taking, hopefully the, uh, hopefully the limbic team offered you a, a, a small oasis of, of relaxed conversation. They're a pretty chill group. Very, very impressive. I, what's the name of your marketing director? Your new marketing director? I, uh, skipping me right John, now. John, John, JB. Oh, that, a, a woman oh, uh, amber. amber amber that was it amber i met her very quickly because she's decided, incredible we're gonna have ross yeah, on yeah, yeah. and she actually she talked about your bridging this kind of phd and academics but your capacity to communicate that's what she described to me so you can so she she and now and now you're just so disappointed with with uh <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. so you're launching no, listen... in the... <laughs> go ahead go you're ahead. launching in the u.s now or you've launched in the u.s we are. We we've signed um, a number of contracts with care provider organisations in the US. Been incredibly humbled by the reception. Um, you know, before we moved uh, out to the US, everybody told us, "Look, you know, this is where companies will come to die, and no <laughs> UK health company really does this well." And and uh, I was really nervous. Um, but yeah. we we had this evidence based differentiated AI products that have been used now by 350,000 patients in the UK across right. demographics is creating value. That's, that, that's demonstrable at this point. That's not a question. Yeah. That's a definite. Yeah. And so we wanted, you know, to achieve the mission, to achieve the vision, to really make the highest quality mental health care available to everyone everywhere. We had to get it out of the UK and we wanted to bring it to the US. So we kind of had our, coming out party in March earlier okay. this year. And I, yeah, just uh, so grateful um, to have found innovative care provider organizations who put almost no time in, you know, in the grand scheme of, of health technology sales to make a call, procure right. a solution, and, and we will be going live imminently with the first awesome. one. Oh, amazing. 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 Well, I'm sure we can keep blowing up our minds and, and getting into the consciousness. But, you know, unfortunately, we, we're not a Tim Ferriss show here. And so we're going to kind of pause here, but leave to Jim Joyce with his final big question to you, Ross. OK, so we're going to we're going to kind of fast forward, then go backwards, Ross. So in the into your consciousness, the uh, so Matt, you're so two years from now, um, you, you finally get to health. You're at health and you're being. Um, introduced on stage uh by lenny kravitz <laughs> by lenny kravitz and he's and he's announcing the fact that limbic has now been has penetrated it's exceeded even its uk metrics it's 45 percent penetrated across the us and people are using this system to non-judgmentally enter into the care and, and people want to hear about how you did this and how you built this team and and this this company's massively successful you're academic entry into now you've made this massive impact and so as you're doing it you're giving this great keynote lenny kravitz is blown away he breaks into song <laughs> on stage and you're I, and taking I, me there i love it your emotions are through the roof and amber and the other fellow and it was name are high five and you're coming off stage but this 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 young kind of academic stops you in the corner and says like ross i gotta talk to you i gotta talk to you and he says you don't understand i you know, you hear from his accent, he's a Southeastern, he's a Londoner. And he says, I've moved to the US. And, you know, I used to break apart things with my dad and chemistry kits on the, you know, I went to Cambridge, but I did my master's. Now I'm launching my own digital health company with emotional AI solving big problems in here. What's that one piece of advice you would give that younger version of yourself? Well, firstly, 
I love the storytelling. The question, you, you took me there. Um, you took me there, Jim. Uh, you, you triggered an emotional reaction. I love it. Um, I, I'm going to tell him um, one piece of advice that definitely won't do you wrong in a chaotic journey that you're embarking on where you can't predict what's going to happen. So I won't even try. Your experience will be different from mine. But I will say the one piece of advice is do your best to surround yourself by very smart people surround one or two won't cut it find people who you think are incredibly smart and knowledgeable and surround yourself by them in whatever way you can and then always trust your own opinion hmm. that's my view love it very thank good. you very much for joining us this was a wonderful journey and i'm sure we'll be keeping in touch and great to meet you on for the first time on on this show that was great. Likewise. Thanks for inviting me. I thoroughly enjoyed the chat. And Thanks for all us. listeners, hit subscribe, pass it on, and see you next week, maybe. <laughs>